Vader, this is an unexpected pleasure. We're honored by your presence. You may dispense with the pleasantries, Commander. I'm here to put you back on schedule. I tell you, this station will be operational as planned. The Emperor does not share your optimistic appraisal of the situation. But he asked the impossible. I need more men. Then perhaps you can tell him when he arrives. You will bring Captain Solo and the Wookiee to me. <laughs> you can either profit by this or be destroyed. Jabba, this is your last chance. Free us or die. The data brought to us by the Botham spies pinpoints the exact location of the Emperor's new battle station. It is protected by an energy shield, which is generated from the nearby forest moon of Endor. You must confront Vader. Then, only then, a Jedi will you be. There is still good in him. He's more machine now than man. Twisted and evil. I know there is good in you. The Emperor hasn't driven it from you fully. From here, you will witness the final destruction of the Alliance and the end of your insignificant rebellion. Well, how could they be damning us if they don't know if we're coming? It's a trap! Here goes nothing. Return of the Jedi shot to the number one spot at the box office May 1983, the final part in George Lucas's epic sci-fi trilogy, produced on a $32 million budget, financed by George himself. It made over $475 million worldwide at the time, making it the most successful film that year, and gained mostly positive reviews from critics. Surprisingly, it made a bit less than Empire Strikes Back, and around $300 million less than the first Star Wars. Sequels in the day certainly made less money than the first part of a series, unlike today where the sequels generally top the first movie in the box office takings. As many fans know, the movie was going to be called Revenge of the Jedi. George had wanted to use Return in the title, but either Fox or one of the producers felt that it didn't work, so they went with Revenge and they printed a lot of posters with that title, and early trailers featured the word Revenge. Also on the posters, Luke was holding a red lightsaber. But weeks before the film was going to be released, George went back with the original title of Return, stating that Jedis never seek revenge. With the Return title being reinstated, the posters had Luke welding a blue lightsaber. I always thought they did this on purpose to hide the new colour that was going to be green. But I think the changes were made because having a blue lightsaber with a sunny background, it's hard to see it in action, and the green colour certainly stands out with that desert backdrop. The release of Jedi saw the introduction of the THX Quality Control Program. With many theatres varying in quality in terms of picture and sound, George wanted there to be a universal quality assurance laid out, so the public can watch and listen to a film how it was intended by the filmmakers. Over time the THX program was used most evidently for home cinema equipment, and especially Laserdisc. Many people came to love THX certified discs. You always knew the picture and sound quality would generally be very good, and all movies started out with that deafening logo. When it came to the DVD and Blu-rays, having something with THX on it kind of made it pointless. You could easily get a better picture on other discs without having it gone through the THX quality test. It did become a bit of a joke over time, seeing even video games with THX on it. Home cinema equipment would have overly inflated prices because it had the THX logo stamped on it. I'm still waiting to see a THX certified oven or toaster. All the original Star Wars films received universal ratings, anyone of any age could watch them, but you think these movies would be rated PG. You have arms and hands being cut off, scary monsters and seeing other creatures getting eaten, it seems the rating board were quite lenient with the Star Wars trilogy. As a kid growing up, I do recall seeing the Return of the Jedi toys still being sold in stores in the late 80s, probably around 88-89. I didn't start buying them till the early 90s, when Star Wars wasn't particularly popular anymore. The droids and Ewok cartoons 
were essentially artificial extensions of the film and were pretty naff because they focused on characters you weren't really interested in and the Ewok spin-off movies were a bit of a joke. It's hard to imagine Star Wars not being popular, but by the late 80s and early 90s it kind of was. Kids had moved on to Turtles, G.I. Joe and Thundercats in the late 80s. I picked up loads of Star Wars stuff dirt cheap at car boot sales and amassed a huge collection. When they released Star Wars again for the last time, so they claimed on VHS and Laserdisc in their original forms, the popularity grew and once they announced they were going to remaster them to be re-released in theatres, everyone became excited again. Having the chance to see them for the first time in a cinema for me instead of watching them on a crusty VHS tape was a chance not to be missed. When I look back at the new footage for the 97 re-releases, I do laugh because some of it is pretty bad. The CGI version of Jabba the Hutt is easily the worst looking out of all the new additions. The DVD release, they certainly improved it. At the time, I was actually quite excited to see what was new, and I was kind of searching for the new CG, but now I say 90% of the new added sequences, they do nothing to improve the story. A New Hope is certainly the worst offender of new stuff. I hated the idea of Jabba being in Episode 4, because it destroys any surprise when it comes to Episode 6, especially for newcomers. They threw in more shots of Boba Fett, just walking around past camera. Ok, I get it, he looks cool, but we don't need to keep cutting away to him standing still or walking past. If he was that important at the time, he wouldn't have been killed in such a poor way. His death is done for laughs, it's just pandering to fans adding in more footage of him. George Lucas admitted his mistake not knowing how popular Boba Fett would become, and would have handled his death better. Return of the Jedi also had the inclusion of that awful dance number. The original sequence was very clunky anyway, and you can see they had a tough time in bringing across what they really wanted, but it was acceptable. But the new stuff really messes up the tone of this movie, it seems so out of place and the song is just garbage. The best stuff of the remastered trilogy is the improvement to the opticals, background plates and sound mix. That's all it really needed. The Blu-ray releases kind of made it worse, adding further silly additions we didn't need, an extra rock in front of R2-D2, or the biggest offender to the Blu-rays is adding NO to Darth Vader at the end, destroying the most important part of the film. In 2004, George further messed with Jedi by adding Hayden Christensen as a ghost at the end. It makes no sense. Luke wouldn't recognise him, his father turned good at an old age. It's probably the most idiotic thing George has done to the original trilogy in a desperate attempt to link it with the prequels. Also, it can be difficult to judge the movie's photographic look. Because the contrast and colours have all been fiddled with in the series, it's hard to determine what Alan Hume, the director of photography, really achieved on Jedi. Looking back at the original copies on Laserdisc, it does have a great mix of earthy colours with a strong contrast. The remaster looks actually more modern with stronger blues and even stronger blacks. I certainly feel Jedi is the best looking out of the three. Everything shot on the Death Star looks amazing. Star Wars fans are probably the most dedicated when it comes to fan edits. There are so many out there of lost count. The original unaltered trilogy is easy to obtain online, or you can just pick up the Laserdisc sets which I did a few years back. You can get official DVD versions that were part of a two disc set, but they aren't the best transfers, taken directly from the Laserdiscs. The Laserdisc versions did incorporate early 90s noise reduction, which results in a smeared image when there's a lot of movement within the picture. With Disney acquiring Lucasfilm, they did say they would release the original unaltered trilogy. So I imagine around the time episode 7 hits theatres, fans will finally get what they've been waiting for for years. It's so stupid though, you can get 5 cuts of Blade Runner on DVD. The Alien films are separated into theatrical and extended cuts, but not for Star Wars. People like having a choice, and George Lucas has denied them that for years. I think there would be certainly less backlash towards him if he had given them the choice when the official DVDs came out in 2004. Everyone has seen the Star Wars films and you all know what happens in Jedi, but just to give some a quick recap. The Empire is rebuilding a more powerful Death Star, and the Emperor is expected to visit soon, but the commanding officer warns Vader they need more men to complete the battle station on time. Luke Skywalker has initiated a plan to rescue Han Solo from the gangster Jabba the Hutt. With the help of Princess Leia, Lando Carizian, Chewbacca, C-3PO and R2-D2, Leia infiltrates Jabba's palace on Tatooine disguised as a bounty hunter and releases Han from the Carbonite, but she is captured and enslaved, while Han Solo is thrown into prison with Chewbacca. Luke soon arrives and allows himself to be captured. After Luke survives a battle with the Rancor monster, 
Jabba sentences Luke and Han to death by being eaten by the mighty Sarlacc. In the original, it looks like a butthole in the middle of the desert, with teeth instead of a large beak. Luke bursts into action and unleashes his new green lightsaber and takes out Jabba's troops, during which Leia strangles Jabba to death. Han accidentally knocks the ever-popular Boba Fett into the gaping mouth of the Sarlacc, and Luke destroys Jabba's sail barge. Luke returns to Dagobah in hopes to finish his training, only to find out that Yoda is dying. With his last breaths, Yoda confirms that Darth Vader is Luke's father. He also mentions another Skywalker. The spirit of Obi-Wan Kenobi confirms to Luke the other Skywalker Yoda speaks of is Luke's twin sister, Leia. Obi-Wan then tells Luke that he must confront Vader again to defeat the Empire. The Rebel Alliance learned of the new Death Star and hatches a plan to destroy it. Han leads a strike team to destroy the battle station's shield generator on the forest moon of Endor, allowing a squadron of starfighters to enter the incomplete superstructure and destroy the station from within. Luke decides to join them, but Vader senses Luke's presence on the shuttle, but lets them through so that the Imperial forces lying in wait on Endor will ambush them. Sensing Vader's presence, Luke fears he is endangering the mission. On Endor, Luke and his companions encounter a tribe of Ewoks. Initially, the Ewoks see them as a threat, but later on form a partnership with them. Luke confesses to Leia that she is his sister and that Vader is their father, and he plans to leave them to confront him in an attempt to turn him to the good side of the Force. Luke surrenders to the Imperial troops so that they will bring him to Vader. He unsuccessfully tries to convince Vader to turn from the dark side of the Force. Vader takes Luke to the Death Star to meet the Emperor, intent on turning his son to the dark side. Return of the Jedi without doubt has the best visual effects out of all the movies produced in the 80s, and they still stand up beautifully today. With the films being remastered heavily over time, Jedi I believe has the smallest amount of alterations. The end battle sequence is truly eye-popping and thrilling. Such speed and attention to detail on the miniatures, it's an incredible achievement. You can clearly tell the guys at ILM really pushed themselves to the limit to produce the final Star Wars film and their efforts paid off because they received an Oscar for their hard work. Jedi features the most alien-like characters. It may have been a decision encouraged by Kenner to introduce more toys. When you do watch Jedi, especially at Jabba's palace, it's like walking onto the set of the Muppets. Jabba the Hutt, without doubt, is the best looking puppet, with many of Jim Henson's people working on him. Also just as impressive is the Rancor Beast, which was originally conceived as a man in a suit, which didn't turn out how they wanted so it was decided to shoot a hand-controlled puppet at a high frame rate. Instead of being in stop motion, which results in a slightly jerky image, you have this smooth motion that really gives great scale and movement to the monster. Jabba's pet basically looks like a sock puppet. It's a shame there's a mix in quality with the puppet-like creatures, but his little pet does provide some good laughs. <coughs> John Williams is the master of film composing, and I've praised him many times before in my previous reviews. All the Star Wars soundtracks are beautifully composed, and great to listen to by themselves. It's really hard to pick which one is my favourite out of the series. I generally find myself listening to A New Hope the most. I'm not sure why, but probably out of all of them, it invokes a great sense of nostalgia for me. Return of the Jedi certainly excels when it comes to the action cues and stirring emotional themes that really help the ending battle between Luke and Vader, and when he burns Vader's body in the traditional Jedi fashion. When the score came out, I believe it was only released on one vinyl, unlike the first film which had a two vinyl set, and Jedi had the longest score composed out of the trilogy. With such limited space on vinyl, a lot of music was left out, and it wasn't given the full score treatment until 1997. It always surprises me that such a popular film series didn't have its full score release for nearly 20 years. What is probably fans' most loved track is the finale between Vader and Luke. The lightsaber battle is accompanied by a dark choir that is incredibly powerful and moving. With the extended celebrations showing new worlds that would feature in the prequels, Williams recomposed the Ewok celebration music. Some prefer the old music and some love the new music, I prefer the new track just because it sounds far grander and definitely stamps its mark on it being the finale, but I must admit I do love the closing cue of the choir singing before the end titles appear on screen in the original. They both have their charm. The soundtrack is easily obtainable on CD and iTunes. 
The first game to be based on the film was Death Star Battle, published by Parker Brothers, which turned up on various Atari platforms and the Spectrum in 1984. The year the film was released saw the now iconic arcade arrive based on the first film, Star Wars Arcade. It had you inside the cockpit of the X-Wing speeding along the trenches of the Death Star, and also impressive for the time was digitised samples of the voices from the film to add to the experience. Atari followed up their series of Star Wars arcades in 1984 with a translation of the final film. The game takes place on an isometric perspective and has you control the speeder bike, an ATST, and finally the Millennium Falcon as it attempts to destroy the Death Star. It was converted to many of the home computers at the time, I played it on the Commodore 64 and actually quite enjoyed it. It was painfully short and quite difficult but nonetheless I still had fun with it. It was a big departure from Atari's previous efforts which had you in the cockpit of an X-Wing which left many disappointed by the changes but it was good for them to do something new. Super Return of the Jedi turned up on the Super Nintendo, Game Boy and surprisingly the Game Gear which didn't receive the previous games and it seemed at first a Nintendo exclusive. The SNES version was a game I desperately wanted as a kid. I picked up Super Empire Strikes Back on sale and adored it. I did complete it without cheating I might add and wanted to continue on with the series. But once Jedi came out I couldn't afford the £50 asking price. For some reason these Super Star Wars games were always expensive, even pre-owned ones at the time. I felt lucky when I got Empire so cheap. When I came to play it, the Jedi game like the others was tough to get through but was very playable and had great graphics at the time. The Mode 7 effects were certainly the best in Jedi. I don't think I ever completed it though, I got to the Death Star but really struggled to work my way through it. When the movies got re-released, Sega got their hands on the license and produced the awesome Star Wars Trilogy Arcade, a 3D on the rails shooter. The game was broken up into the individual movies. Return of the Jedi focused on the speeder bike sequence and the second part you battle over Endor and enter the Death Star. I briefly played it when it came out and was thoroughly impressed. It's quite hard to find one now without screen burn, down to the rear projection screen Sega used for the arcade, but you can emulate it on a PC or Apple Mac. When it comes to the Star Wars films they have been discussed to death, being picked apart and analysed by the fans to such a large extent it can be difficult to add anything new or offer a different perspective on the series. Return of the Jedi was my favourite Star Wars film as a kid. I'm reading some of the feedback recently from my followers. They said it was their favourite as well, but felt a bit embarrassed or ashamed to admit it. You shouldn't feel bad if it's your favourite. It had great action set pieces, Luke as being the hero he was meant to be, and the ending was incredibly moving and above all epic. It was the perfect way to finish the trilogy off. Return of the Jedi probably has the best ending still to a series of movies. Toy Story 3 and Return of the King may come close. Over the years I began to favour Empire Strikes Back more. It is a more consistent film with its story and there is a lot more drama and the characters you've warmed to are under great strains to survive. It certainly has the best story out of the three part act. People mostly highlight the Ewoks as the biggest problem for the film. I don't think they are as hated as say Jar Jar Binks. It certainly is the main point of discussion when someone raises their personal issues with the movie and George Lucas is aware of the hate towards them. The introduction of the Ewoks is certainly the moment I lose interest in the film's plot. Really once the Rebels discuss their plans and then land on Endor and encounter the Ewoks I feel the movie kind of sags a bit. You have the fantastic speeder bike chase but everything else is a little forgettable. It loses its momentum for me. George wanted the focus of the story to be around the battle of old and new technology. The Wookiees were originally intended but down to the fact they are good with technology there would be no comparison between old and new tech so the primitive Ewoks were designed to be used instead. I don't think kids at the time had a problem with the Ewoks, but I think as many got older they find it silly the Emperor's best troops are defeated by a bunch of teddy bears. What I like about the Ewoks is the babies because they do look really cute, and you can see an Ewok smoking Endor weed. Howson Ford felt he should have been killed off in Empire Strikes Back, but George Lucas wanted to bring him back. Like every Star Wars fan we all love Han Solo, but in Jedi he doesn't really have much to do, he just has to destroy the shield generator. His dialogue is nothing exciting, it's great his story arc is finished and tied up with Leia in the end and it would have been a shame for Han Solo to have been killed off in Empire but it would have been a very deadly move. Richard Marquand barely ever gets a mention when Jedi is discussed, even in the documentaries he is brushed over. He sadly passed away at 49 years old in 1987. George Lucas had said that Richard wasn't that familiar with visual effects so he took over supervising a lot of the technical shots 
but the best stuff in Jedi and what people are so fond of is the emotional dialogue driven scenes which are all handled by Richard. If you listen to the commentary to the film George was very supportive of Richard and highlights his skills as a director. Whenever there is an emotional scene it works every time and you have to thank Richard for that. There are loads of great moments in Jedi. Ian McDermott steals the film, a classically trained actor. He brings so much to the character of the Emperor and is the only reason why I'd be persuaded to watch the prequels, especially episode three. The humor in the film works very well throughout. C-3PO to me is at his most comical in this movie, especially when he sees Jabba attempt to lick Leia. Oh, oh I can't bear to watch. One issue that critics raised at the time was that it felt a bit like a repeat of the first film because the Death Star is back and you have the remaining rebels attacking it again. This is probably nitpicking but the movie doesn't really offer much new with its locations. They return to Tatooine and Yoda's home. You have Endor but it doesn't really feel unique in any way. Empire Strikes Back gave you so many different locations it felt like a far larger universe and with Jedi it feels quite small. Return of the Jedi provides a very satisfying end to the original trilogy. We know they're now doing another three films, but if they weren't then I would still class this as the best way to end the franchise. The finale is sad and happy at the same time. I don't know any other movies that really provoke those emotions so strongly with me. When Lando blasts out the Death Star I feel like crying with joy and when Luke burns Vader it's incredibly sad, but then it's happy again two minutes later. It's an emotional roller coaster. I don't know how anyone could not like Star Wars. I understand if you don't like the prequels, I don't like them either, but the original trilogy is so incredibly entertaining it's hard not to be impressed by them. I'm sure some have lost interest in the franchise down to the constant re-edits to the original trilogy and the overdose of merchandise. But when you do sit down and watch the originals again, you instantly fall in love with them and you realise that's why it's the most popular series of films ever made. But it don't let me down. Fire at will, Commander. I will not turn. And you'll be forced to kill me. If that is your destiny. Now, young Skywalker, you will die. It's gonna blow! Jedi, like my father before me. <laughs> <laughs>